morning, everybody, and welcome to the Sabbath morning worship service of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Aldershot Street in St. John's, Newfoundland. Welcome to those of you who are here in the congregation with us this morning. A slightly belated welcome to those who are on their way and hurrying to get here, and I'm sure will join us within the next few minutes. And a special welcome to anyone uh, listening to this service after the fact on uh, Lighthouse FM, and also to those who are watching right now, tuning in via our live stream. We are very, very welcome, no matter what, uh, what means people are joining us by, to have you here with us, uh, either in body or in spirit, in the house of the Lord this morning. And I would like to uh, take a moment to ask you uh, just to smile and greet one another. For those who are comfortable doing so, if you want to get up and shake hands, you can. If you want to just smile and turn, at those, turn to those around you with a welcoming smile and wave, that would be wonderful also. Let's just take a moment to, uh, to greet one another with a, with a warm Sabbath morning welcome. on behalf of the congregation to those who are watching the live stream who I know uh, we also welcome as well. It's wonderful to see everybody's smiles uh, this morning and to see people welcoming and greeting one another. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to be in the Lord's house together. Um, I would like to uh, introduce to you those taking part in the service this morning. My name is Trudy Morgan Cole and as well as the welcome I will be having the children's feature a little later on in the service. Our sermon uh, this morning is going to be brought to us by our head elder Andrew Simpson uh, and his wife Nalisha is going to be uh, leading our praise time in a little while. Janice is going to be leading us in our offering call. Uh, Mackenzie is coming up a little later on for our special music. Uh, we have Malcolm scheduled uh, for scripture reading, but if Malcolm is not here, I may be stepping into, uh, into that role. And of course, as always, we give thanks to those who make the service possible uh, while not being, uh, not being up front. Uh, to our deacons this morning, which I think are Jason and Huey, uh, to Bill and Brian and Chris up in the, uh, the audio-visual booth, and uh, thanks, of course, to Edwin on the piano. And I believe I was informed this week that this is Edwin's last week with us for some time until the end of summer. And I just want to say how grateful we are for your music ministry to us over these past months and how we will, uh, we will miss it. For our call to worship this morning, I would like to read uh, a few verses from Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7, and then skipping down to verse 12. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you can seek a, we can seek you while you may be found, and we know that you can be found in this place today, and we pray that you will be with each person here, that we will be aware of your constant presence, and that when we leave this place today, we will indeed go out with joy and be led forth in peace. In your name we pray, amen. I would like to invite Nalicia to come up now and lead us in our time of praise. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. So our first song will be number eight, We Gather Together.
number 246, Worthy, Worthy is the Lamb. Savior leads me.
Amen. Thank you for leading us, Nalisha. And that's one of my very favorite hymns there, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Our scripture reading this morning is from the words of Jesus, taken from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. For our offering this morning is for a local church budget. Jesus was enrolled to Jerusalem when he heard ten lepers shouting, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, that is found in Luke chapter 17, verse 13. Christ acknowledged the request and told them to show themselves to the priest. As they were walking away, they noticed Jesus had already healed their leprosy. Their skin was soft and silky. No trace of disease remained. One of the former lepers turned around and returned to honor Jesus for the miracle. Only one. Often we are recipients of God's grace. We pray, we plead, and we, become, and we come before the Lord with our petition. When God grants us his grace, there are many who forget to thank the Lord for his mercies. There are many ways to thank the Lord. One way is by offering him a thanks offering. When a child is born in good health, some give us a thanks offering to express gratitude to the Lord. A successful surgery can be opportunity to give a thanks offering to Jesus, the great physician. When a child returns home after having wandered away, we rejoice. In the story of the prodigal son, the father held a feast thank thanking the Lord for the return of his son. Today, we can honor our Lord for his many gifts. We can thank him for his grace, for his protection, and for his love toward us. And when we, and we will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer it with your own will. That is found in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 29. And let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Holy Sabbath day. We thank you for bringing us here in the church to worship with you. We thank you also for the offering that we brought today uh, to offer for you and also for the use for furthering of your works here on earth while we are waiting for your soon return. We pray this, Lord, and bless every one of us that here in the church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
to lead us into our time of prayer. We're going to sing together hymn number 671, Now, Dear Lord, as we pray, and then Andrew will come forward to lead us as we kneel in prayer. pray. Oh, gracious Father in heaven, you, O oh God, who saw us throughout this week, you who woke us up each morning, gave us the strength to carry on, you, O oh God, who sends the rain, the sunshine, the wind, the snow, you are God who sit on the seat of heaven, you who rule over the affairs of the universe. We give you all praise, all honor, all glory. You, creator God, redeemer God, sustainer God, you're truly worthy of all our praise. And so as we come this morning, O oh God, with our hearts, Lord, on our knees, as we approach your cross today, we want to lay all our burdens at the foot of the cross. We want to cede control of our lives over to you, and we want to put you in the driver's seat. And we want to trust you to take control of our lives. And, O oh God, as we have come today, O oh God, it is a sign that we want to be made whole. It is a sign that we want to be revived and refreshed and revitalized. And so we pray today that you may prepare our hearts for this refreshing that you may prepare our minds for this refreshing, that you may prepare us for the blessing you have in store for us. You may prepare us for the message you have in store for us. As we look around us, we understand, oh God, because of the signs of the times, your coming is closer than when we first believe. And so, oh God, we ask for strength in these last days to carry on. We ask for more faith to hold on to you, O oh God, despite what may happen around us. We ask, O oh God, for peace of mind and courage in these last days. We ask, O oh God, for your spirit to help us to crucify ourselves afresh on a daily basis. And we ask, O oh God, for such an indwelling presence of your spirit so that we, O oh God, may continue to live the lives that you've called us to live. We may continue to be overcomers through Christ, O oh Lord. Forgive us of our sins today, O oh God, and I pray that at the end of this service, each and every person here, regardless of what we're going through, regardless of our circumstances, will leave this place rejoicing because we have had an experience with the life change of Jesus Christ. Bless our prayers. Be with us, O oh God, throughout this service. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Let the church of God say, amen.
the boys and girls, all the children to come up to the front now for children's story. such a nice group of children here today. We have enough to fill up the front bench. We might even have might even have enough to go on to the second bench or maybe just enough to all squeeze up together on the front bench. It is wonderful to see so many children here today. Well, I don't know if any of you were listening earlier when I read the scripture reading. You don't you know, it's okay, I don't, I'm not too worried if you weren't listening, because sometimes boys and girls don't listen to the whole church service, but as long as you're listening to this part, that's good. But the verse that I read for scripture reading that uh, our elder Andrew picked out for his sermon, it says that if we want to follow Jesus, we must deny ourselves. Now, deny is not a very big word, but it's not one we use every day either. Who here knows what deny means? Can any, any one of you tell me what it means to deny something, or have you ever heard that before? It's okay if you haven't. Or if you have and you think you might know, but you don't want to say out loud in case you're wrong, that's okay too. But deny just means to say no. Now, when would we ever have to say no to ourselves? Well, I want you to think about that question. I asked Brian to put up on the screen a picture of my dog. This is my dog, Gal, and some of you might have heard me tell stories about her before because I love her very much. I don't know if any of you here have a dog in your home, or if not, maybe you might have a dog at your friend's house that you may be gone to visit sometime. If you notice a house with a dog in it, especially if it's a puppy, people spend a lot of time saying, no, no, don't jump up on the couch. No, don't eat that. No, don't play with that. No, you can't have that. And sometimes in houses with little boys and girls in them, moms and dads and nannies and grandpas and babysitters have to spend a lot of time saying no too, right? Do people say no to you a lot? Can I play with this? No. Can I eat this before supper? No. Can I go here? No, you have to do this. No. Can I go outside right now? No, you have to finish your homework. And it seems like you hear so many people say, no, 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 no. Well, I think dogs feel that way too because people are always telling them no. We're very lucky because our dog gal doesn't do too many things that we have to say no to. But every once in a while we have to tell her, no, no. When she first came to live with us, that was a few years ago now, she wasn't a little puppy. Most people, when they get a new dog, they get a tiny puppy. But we adopted her from a shelter, and she was already mostly a grown-up dog. But she had been a stray, which means she didn't have an owner, and she lived on the street, and she mostly fed herself by eating out of people's garbage. So she was very hungry. And she would eat anything that she saw lying around, even if it wasn't meant to be for dogs. And the very first day, she came to our house in the evening, and we got her settled in, and she liked us, and we liked her. We made a comfy bed for her. And in the morning, I had to go to work, and I thought, oh, this little dog is so well-behaved and so nice, it will be okay to leave for a couple of hours. And when I came home at lunchtime, I found our little dog, Gal, our brand new dog, sitting in the back porch of the house where we had some food up on some open shelves, and she was surrounded by every candy and chocolate bar wrapper in the house. She had found all the candy, all the chocolates, eaten them all, only left the wrappers. I think she even ate some of the wrappers. Now, I don't know if you know this, chocolate and candy bars are not even really good for people except as a treat now and then but they're very, very bad for dogs. And if dogs eat chocolate bars, they can get really, really sick. But Gal didn't know that. There was nobody home to tell her no when she went to try and get the chocolate bars. Nobody to say, no, that's not for puppies. You can't have that. And so I had to take her in the car and take her to the vet. And the vet had to give her some medicine. 
and she got kind of sick, and it was not a good first day at our house for our puppy gal. But she was okay afterwards, and now she won't go near chocolate bars. She learned her lesson. But it happened because we weren't there to say no. And sometimes bad things happen when nobody's there to tell you no. So that takes us back to our scripture reading and deny yourself. Say no to yourself. Well, sometimes it seems like the grown-ups in your life might be telling you no to a lot of things. Maybe they say no more often than you'd like. But as you get older, you're going to have to make more decisions for yourself. And there'll be times when you have to decide to do something when there's no grown-up around to tell you what to do. Just like a dog might have to decide what to do when there's no owner around to say no. But we're a little bit smarter than dogs. And as we get older, we get smarter and we get wiser. Now, lots of times you can say yes to yourself when you decide whether to do something. Should I do something kind for somebody? Yes. Should I go out and play in the sunshine on a beautiful day? Yes. Should I eat a healthy snack? Yes. But there's times when you have to decide to do something and maybe there's nobody around to tell you whether to do it when you might have to say no to yourself. Should I tell a lie to get myself out of trouble? No. Should I take something that doesn't belong to me? No. If I'm playing with a friend and they say something I don't like, should I hit them? No. There's lots of things that happen in life that we have to make a decision and sometimes if we want to follow Jesus and do things Jesus' way, we have to learn to say no to ourselves. And that's what it means when the Bible says to deny yourself. Sometimes, just like you would tell a puppy no, they can't eat the chocolate for their own good, and just like someone when you're little might tell you no, you can't touch the stove because it's hot, sometimes we have to tell ourselves no and say, this isn't a good thing for me to do because this isn't something that Jesus wants me to do. So I hope, boys and girls, you will all, as you grow, learn to make good choices and learn that there are lots of times to say yes, but there's some times that you just have to say no. And Jesus will help us to make those decisions. Thank you, boys and girls. You've been great. Can you go back to your seats now? And as the boys and girls go back to their seats, we'll uh, be leading into our special music with Mackenzie.
Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. So happy to be in the house of God. What do you say? So blessed. So blessed to be alive. So blessed to breathe fresh air. So blessed to be able to walk and to express ourselves. You know, these things we... We take for granted sometimes, but we ought to give God thanks for these, these things that we don't think about, think about often. I'd like to thank Trudy for, for leading out in the service thus far and for the children's story, which lined up so perfectly with my message. I'd also like to thank Everyone was participated in each segment of the service, also the congregants who chose to come to church. Those watching on YouTube, we're very grateful for your presence. Also, uh, for even the people who keep the church clean. You know, Trudy uh, mentioned this morning some folk who made service possible, but also for, for Ed, who helps to keep the church in a neat fashion. We're very grateful for, for that service. Because imagine if we should come to church and the church is uh, disheveled and dirty. You know, would we, feel, would we feel good about that? We wouldn't. That's a rhetorical question. And so we're very grateful for each person who works behind the scene to make everything possible as it relates to the work of God and church life. My sermon today is entitled Priceless. Priceless, and we'll read uh, together the scripture reading. But before we read the scripture reading, let us say a word of prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, I pray at this moment that you will take away self from me. I pray that you will empty me of everything that is unlike you, everything that will hinder your word from going forth with power, clarity, and conviction today. And fill me with the power and presence of your spirit so that I may be effective 
in ministering to your people your words of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. I will be reading today from the New King James Version. You can follow in whatever version you have. When you have found it, please say amen. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. I'm preaching under the caption today, Priceless. The Bible reads, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Today I'm going to preach on the three specific points. My first point will be the denying of self. My second point will be the taking off of our, of our cross. And my third point will be following Jesus. Between 2007 and 2014, rhino killings in South Africa surged by more than 29%. At $60,000 a kilogram, rhino horn is more valuable on the Asian black market than gold and cocaine. As valuable as rhino horn is on the Asian black market, there is something even more valuable in life. In fact, today I want to posit to us that the most valuable commodity of all is our soul salvation. Yet, comparatively, very few people invest any amount of time and effort in securing everlasting life. Any may have eternal life, yet instead of striving to enter in at the narrow gate, masses are taking the broad road that leads to destruction. That which stands between a sinner and salvation is the sinner's will. As Trudy said in her story, the cultivating of an attitude of saying no to what is not good for you and yes to what is good for you is very important as a Christian. Denying of one's self and one's priorities and taking up not only the cross of Christ, but our cross is neither pleasant nor easy. However, my friends, the drive to indulge one's selfish self is very real, very present, very active, and very strong in our lives today. The Bible tells us that we should deny ourselves if we want to follow Jesus. And as we look in Matthew chapter 16, just before Jesus made that statement, and you can uh, pitch your sermonic tent there today, your, your scriptural tent, as we look at the passage. Just before Jesus says we should deny ourselves, Jesus asks a very specific question. Who do men say that I am? The Bible tells us in Matthew 16 and verse 14, some people said John the Baptist some said Elijah, and others said Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus became more specific, and he asked, but who do you say that I am, disciples? And Simon Peter answered and said, as he always does, the one at the forefront, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And look how ironic this is. Because Jesus answered Simon, and Jesus said to him, Simon, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And look at how life comes at, us, comes at us very fast. Because in the same text, in the same pericope, in the same body of scripture, Jesus had to rebuke Simon Peter. The Bible tells us in verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. 
But look at Simon Peter now. He had to come into the picture. The Bible tells us in verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to put him in his place. How dare you, Jesus, say that you're going to die? Simon said, far be, from, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You see, even though Satan was speaking through Simon Peter, just as though God in heaven spoke through Simon Peter. Did you catch that? As much as God may speak through us, the devil may also speak through us. Simon Peter was not denying himself. And that is why Jesus had to make that appeal, not only to Simon Peter, not only to the other disciples, but to anyone who desires to become a Christian, anyone who desires to be a follower of Christ. Because as much as we can be Christians and be followers of Christ, we can also be used by the devil. And so denying of one's own priorities and one, one's own selfish uh, gain is very critical for us today. You see, the word translated deny in our text is in the original language built from two words, which means from and deny. It, in essence, means to disable and to run away from. In other words, Christianity is not self-enhancement or self-modification or even self-suppression. Christianity is all about self-abandonment. There is no room for ourselves when it comes on to following Jesus. In fact, Christianity, my friends, can be very difficult, especially in the 21st century, because we live in a culture of self-confidence, of self-esteem, of self-discovery. You see, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Tumblr give us a platform to revel in ourselves and to invite others to do the same. You have influencers. You make posts and people comment and people like and subscribe and re revel in self. I preached two weeks ago that I, I, I did Disney and religion at Mun. And in my pop psychology and religion class, I told you how the common theme in the Disney films that we watched was to look within ourselves. You see, when I went into my teacher's classroom, it was a picture of Jack Sparrow, and it looked very impressive. But on that picture was the words in, uh, uh, inscribed, look within yourself. You see, we have many new age gurus that teach us to look within ourselves for the strength to live abundantly. But what, what does it mean to deny ourselves today, my friends? Because we need to understand that there is nothing good to look within ourselves for. But we need to deny ourselves and to allow Christ to empower us to live. What do you say? You see, in order for us to deny ourselves today, it means that we are done with ourselves. We are divorced from ourselves. We are broken up from ourselves. We are done with our ways. We are done with what pleases us. We are done with our thoughts, ambitions, and desires because they all take second place to Jesus. Notice, if you will, that I say they take second place to Jesus because Jesus comes first and then our thoughts and then our priorities, because Jesus should be the center of our lives. What do you say? Our wills are surrendered to Jesus. And what matters now is, is not ourselves so much because we have denied ourselves. But what more importantly matters is the one whom we follow. This is difficult for many persons 
to hear, even for those who are very meticulous in planning and wanting to be in control of their lives. You see, the most vulnerable we can be is when we're in an airplane or in a ship, a cruise ship, or in something that someone else is in charge of. And we put our faith and trust and confidence in the pilots. We assume that they know what they're doing. We assume that they're competent enough. We assume that the captain of the ship is competent enough when we go on the ferry, Marine Atlantic. And we rest easy, we sleep easy. 30 something thousand feet in the air, on the sea, the vast expanse of the sea. But when it comes to giving God full control of our lives, we do not trust him enough for that. We do not trust him enough to lead in our experiences. You see, to deny yourself is to pray the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. I'm sure Jesus had his own priorities. I'm sure Jesus wanted to crumble and give up under the pressure of sin that weighed down on him. But he said, God, not my priorities, not my pleasures, not my way, not my will, but your will be done. To deny ourselves is to look to the interests of others rather than our own personal interests. The preacher is in no way saying that we shouldn't look out for our priorities and our interests. But when we come to Christ, my friends, it's about surrendering our hearts and minds to him, Edwin, and to be servants of those around us. What do you say? To deny ourselves, my friends, is to have as our ambition the pleasing of Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, as Christians, we need the freedom from the tyranny of the self, and this is a primary facet of our walk or pilgrim journey on this earth. Since, my friends, we are designed to worship God and to serve other people, a key component of Christ's work must be to unlock ourselves from that stranglehold of self. You see, everything that God stands for is very different from what the world stands for. The world is all about self and all about finding the strength from within to carry on. It is a vulnerable place to give up control of your life. When someone else is in control of your experiences, but we do it every day. We give up control of our finances. We have a financial advisor who looks after our monetary concerns. We have no issues doing things like this, my friends. But today I'm saying to us, if we want to follow Jesus, we need to first deny ourselves. The crucifying of ourselves is very critical. You see, my friends, the nine of oneself is much like enlisting in the army. See, when you sign on the dotted line to enlist in whatever country's army or military, you have made a commitment to deny yourself, my brothers and sisters. Your first stop will be boot camp, where you will learn that you no longer matter. They will tell you that you will rise at a certain time. They will tell you what and when you will eat. They will tell you where you will go. They will tell you when you will shower and shave. They will tell you what is on the agenda for a specific day. They tell you how long you will be doing it. They tell you when to stop. They tell you when to lie on your bed for rest. And after the boot camp is completed, they tell you where you will serve. You can't pick and choose where you go, if they say you're going to Iraq, you're going to Iraq. If they say you're going to Alaska, you're going to Alaska. If they say you're going to Jamaica, you're going to Jamaica. Wherever you're sent, you have to go. And so as men and women who enlist in the army, we also, having enlisted as followers of Christ, need to cede control of our lives to him. And where he sends, we should go. Are you listening to the word of God today? See, my friends, on our journey in this life, and if you look 
at the rest of the text in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says, those who want to gain their lives will lose it. Edmar, serious message. Those who will lose their life for my sake will gain it because we are living in the last days of earth's history where our allegiance to God will be called into question. We will be called to take a stand. And if we want to keep house, and if we want to keep status, and if we want to keep prestige, it will all be for naught when Jesus comes again because the house, the money, the investments, the big houses and cars and all these fashionable things, the status in life will all be burnt up in that fire that will destroy everything. Are you listening to me? This is serious stuff. But as my brother said in the Sabbath school this morning, when judgment comes, if we're on the side of Jesus, we have nothing to be concerned about. Are you listening to me? Because judgment is good news for the saints of God. You see, when you read Revelation, you see all those big dragons and you see all these imageries that, that bring uh, concern and fear. We should not fear because judgment is about the saints. It's about the vindication of the saints. Are you listening to the word of God? It's good news for us if we take shelter and solace in Jesus Christ, if we take time to cultivate our relationship with him. Just as how when we have relationships with our families or schools or workplaces, we, beloved friends, have to cultivate these relationships. My second point today is one of taking up our cross. Notice the text did not say taking up the cross of Christ. Christ carried his cross. But we too, as Christ was saying to the disciples that day, the path I am going to trod the path I am taking up Golgotha Hill, the sufferings, the rebuke, the abuse that I suffered, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to take up your cross beam, you have to put it on your shoulder, and you have to trod that same path. There is no escaping it, my friends. You see, taking up our cross is similar to a wedding ceremony for those who are married or for those who have attended wedding ceremonies. See, wedding ceremonies are called death ceremonies. Why is it called death ceremonies? It's called death ceremonies because during the wedding ceremony, the groom says to the bride, I am now dead to myself and I'm living for you. When I went to the, the altar with my wife, I had to say some vows. It's, about, it's not about me, it's about you. And the bride, my wife, she had to say the same thing. It's not about me, it's about you. And it's the same with Christ. When we get married to Christ, when we get baptized, when we come into a relationship with him, we're in essence saying to Jesus, it's not about me, Christ, it's about your will and your way. What do you say? You don't believe what the preacher is saying? Let us hear what the Apostle Paul has to say in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I... He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but who lives? It is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in my sinful flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I know it's difficult to hear that you have to give up control, especially if you're successful in your personal lives especially if your bosses or uh, presidents or CEOs or managers or supervisors in your jobs, you're very important. You are the breadwinner in your families. People look to you and you have status and importance. But when you come to Jesus, Jesus wants you to see control of your lives in the bigger scheme of things, in the grander scheme of things. As Christ was saying to Peter, Peter, listen to me, I know you were looking for an earthly redeemer to redeem you and the Jews from Roman oppression. But listen to me, Peter. It's not about you. It's a bigger picture at play. You know, it's like when you listen to the news, the intelligent communities, they say, the intelligence communities, they say it's a matter of national security. Peter, Jesus was saying, it's a matter of national security. It's a bigger issue than yourself. 
Deny yourself and your need and desire to overthrow Roman oppression. Because Peter, when I'm done, when I've done it my way, I'm not only overthrowing Roman oppression, but I'm overthrowing the oppression of Satan. What do you say? So following Christ, my friends, requires a cross. It requires a cross. It requires the dying to self in such a real way that we can say with Paul, it is no longer I who live. It means, my friends, to give up our lives so completely that Christ is able to fill us. Like the songwriter says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Following Christ, my friends, means the old self is dead and continues to die. It's a process of sanctification. You know, people may say, oh, but you're still, you're still doing that. You're still doing this. You say, you see, my, my God is ironing out all the defects. You know, see, like when you iron your shirt or your garment or you use your steamer and you get out all the defects, that is what Christ is doing in our lives. He's ironing out all the defects. He's polishing us, my friends, for eternity. He's, he's molding our characters to go to heaven. And so if someone is, is trying to use your past as a beating stick, tell them, listen, my God is still working on me to make me what he wants me to be. Don't let the naysayers discourage you, my friends. Don't let uh, all these people who want to bring you down with your past, who want to allow themselves to be used by Satan to deny you from going to heaven, don't let them drag you down with them. Because when Jesus comes again, my friends, and when he gathers us on the sea of glass, my friends, all the naysayers, all those who were, were saying to you that you weren't doing the fashionable thing in life, they will be sorry. And they'll be running to the rocks, begging them to fall on them. Don't allow those around you to stunt and stymie your progress in Jesus. What do you say? See, fallen Christ, my friends, left no doubt in the disciples' mind that day what he meant by taking up their cross. They were so bombarded with crucifixions in the, 20, in the first century that they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. See, Jesus was telling his disciples to be ready and to be willing to die for me. But the picture of the cross, my friends, is much more than dying. See, in our societies today, namely in the United States of America, my friends, a common form of execution is by lethal injection to ensure that the victims felt little pain. But imagine, my friends, if Jesus simply said, take your lethal injection. <laughs> that would mean no suffering, my brother. But when Jesus used the picture of taking up your cross, many images passed through the minds of the disciples because not only... Were they going to carry the cross? But they were going to carry the suffering that came with the cross. They were going to carry the pain that was included with the cross. They were going to carry the difficulty that was included, the hardship, the ridicule, the abuse, my friends, that was included. Because dying by the cross was the slowest form of death in the first century. It was the most painful form of death in the first century. It meant suffering, not only for the person dying, but also for their loved ones watching on. Also for those who dared to test the Romans, to say to them, look at what will happen to you if you test us. And let, 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 me, let me bring it home to us. Let me bring it home to us, because we're familiar with drug cartels. And I, and, I, and, I, and I saw a film called The Narcos by Pablo Escobar. And, and the film, my friends, said that Pablo Escobar would say is either the, the, the money or, or, or the lead. I think it was plata or plomo or something like that. For, forgive my Spanish, but that's what, what he was saying. You either take money from me or you die by the gun. He was ruthless. 
and Pablo Escobar wasn't afraid to go to whatever lengths he needed to go to intimidate those around him, to intimidate the government of Colombia. At one point in time, Pablo Escobar he just wanted to get to one individual, and that individual was flying on a plane. And Pablo Escobar brought the entire plane down for that one individual, my friends. That is how the Romans were, and that is what crucifixion was. The Romans wanted to send a message so the next person wouldn't dare cross them. And that is what Jesus is saying. Jesus chose the most arduous way to die for us. And my friends, as Jesus says in Matthew 10 and verse 22, you will be hated on all accounts because of my name. And so we must escape ourselves and run to Jesus before the time of testing comes, my friends. We need to cultivate the characters where we can stand like the brave when those times of testing come. When it's either you do what the governments want you to do or you suffer the consequences. Are you listening to me? It may sound like fairy tale, my friends. But it's very real. And my last point today is one of following Jesus. You would think this one would go without saying, but it doesn't. Sadly, many church folk could define their version of Christianity without mentioning Jesus. This is a talking. See, my friends, this is all about the path of obedience to come after Jesus, to follow him, to pursue him is one of obedience to him. It's pretty simple. Jesus is our leader. We will do what he says. See, there was a time in the ministry of Jesus when he spoke to those who were attempting to have a Lord whom they didn't follow. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus asked them in Luke 6 and verse 36, Who do you call me? And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not say, and do not do what I say? Jesus says you cannot have a Lord that you do not obey. It doesn't work. It's like a coach who coaches a sports team and the players don't listen to him. How else are they able to win a game, my friends, if they don't listen and internalize what the coach is saying and follow what the coach is saying and follow the plays? How else will they scale to the heights of greatness? How else will they win the game if they do not follow the coach who has the experience and the knowledge and the know-how? It's the same with Christ. We will never get to heaven if we do not listen to him, obey his words, the roadmap, the guide to a life lived in Christ. How else will we get to heaven if we do not listen to Christ? You see, my friends... If we do not listen to Christ, it's like swimming without getting wet. It's like having dessert without eating the fattening part of it. It is like living without breathing. It is impossible, my friends. To have a Lord means that you have a master whom you will obey. What do you say? See, many get involved in church thinking that it will be like Netflix. I like this one. See, because Netflix conforms to your individual preferences as you choose the shows and the movies you like. You, you all know, you watch Netflix. It learns your tastes and, your, and presents options tailored to you. Google is much like that too. Based on your search history and the algorithm that collects your data, you will also see ads targeted at your preferences. However, my friends, Christianity is not like Google and Netflix. Christianity is more like a cross. See, my friends, nothing in Christianity is about our preferences. You know, people fight in church, Edmar, about what they prefer. And they bring church into disrepute because of their preferences. But today I'm calling on all of us to deny ourselves. It's not about us, it's about Christ. What do you say? Christianity is not about preferences and what I prefer and what is to my palate and my taste and my liking. No, Christianity is about death. It's about Christ 
living inside of us, filling us with the power and presence of his spirit and changing us from the inside out and allowing us to live that life out to those around us and to be the Christ that people will see and to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love Christ with all our hearts, our souls, our minds. Christianity is about cultivating a character for heaven. Are you listening to the word of God? So instead of getting involved in church motivated by personal preferences and expectations, my friends, today I say to us, follow Jesus. When you come to church, remember that self should stay at the door. You're coming to further the cause of Christ. You're not coming with any agendas. You're not coming to, to, to push through anybody. Are you listening to the word of God? You're not coming to have your way. You're not no politician. You're a follower of Christ. And so as I close, I say to us today, be a self-denying, cross-carrying follower of Jesus. What do you say? That is my message to us today. God bless you. Let's stand for the closing hymn, I will follow thee, my Savior. That's hymn 6, 2, 3. I will follow thee. You may stand.
gracious God in heaven. As you mention to us in your words, we should deny ourselves self being the greatest deterrent to having a relationship with you. Not only should we deny ourselves, O oh God, but you asked us to take up our cross. You have already carried your cross, O oh God. It is now our turn to take up our cross and to follow the path that you've blazed for us, the example that you've set for us. But, O oh God, in order for us to do this, O oh God, we need the indwelling power and presence of your spirit. Because we know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We need more and more of your power, Jesus. So fill us with this power that we need in these last days. Fill us with the courage, the holy boldness. We need to stand like the brave, to stand up for you, Jesus, amidst all the naysayers, amidst the bright lights, amidst the temptations, Amidst the earthly and temporal gain, help us to say no to these things and yes to you. As you had said no, O God, when you were transported up to that mountaintop and shown the glories of this life, the pleasures of this life by Satan. And if only, O God, he said, if you only you had bowed down and worshipped him, he would have given all these things to you, which we know was a lie. And you rightly said no. Help us, O oh God, to say no to things that are not good for us in this life, things that will not help us to secure our soul salvation. And help us, O oh God, to say yes to everything that will strengthen our relationship with you, that will help us to be more loving to our brothers and sisters on a daily basis, that will give us a heart and a burden for souls, and that will help us to go to heaven. Continue to be with us on this year's Sabbath day. Continue to help us to enjoy the rest that we can only find in your person, Jesus. And forgive us of our sins and help us, O oh God, as we go on to this untried week that will come upon us. Help us to have the strength to carry on in this life for the life to come. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.